You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyder's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 180, continuing the NAR conversation with Dr. Michael L. Brown. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how are you? Very good, very good. And you just like the episode title describes it, we're going to continue what we started last time with, with Holly Pivik, you know, the criticisms of the new apostolic reformation and her you know, sharing her concerns. Now we're going to get a little bit of pr- perspective uh, on the other side, you know, to someone who's you know, in it and sees, you know, positives and certainly some negatives too. And personally, I haven't been exposed to anything NAR, really. And I got an email from somebody uh, was talking about another subject. They sent me uh, a link to a video, which is the Bethel music. Uh, I noticed that it was some of the music. And I know some of the people are having great conversations on face in our Facebook group. Uh, if you're not mm-hmm. in there, you need to get in there. Uh, having great conversations about uh, the Bethel's music and things of that nature. So uh, I played the video and I loved it. You know, I have never really, I'm not that big of a fan of, quote, worship music, I guess is what Mm -hmm. they uh, label it as. And uh, I know at my own church, um, I poo-poo the music a lot because uh, (laughs) the songs are like 12, 15 minutes long. We got to stand. and With six words over and over again. Yes. And as soon as I think that one song's over, right into another song. Mike, the last service I went to. It's been a while. It was 45 minutes of standing up and there was nothing but singing. And it's just like, I don't got time to sit here through 45 minutes of songs. Are you saying uh, ain't nobody got time for that? Is yeah. That- <laughs> <laughs> now, and so I'm just not a big fan of worship music. But having said that, Mike, I listened. So I started listening to Now, granted, I didn't listen to all the Bethel music. I know they're very popular, but I absolutely loved it. I mean... I got goosebumps yeah, I, on I, some of it. I mean, I couldn't tell you what was. I'm about the most unmusical person <laughs> on the face of the earth. Well, you know, this, maybe somebody like born in the Antarctic or something. Well, and, I'm gonna you tell know. you, I can see what the <laughs> hype's about. Bethel music is awesome. Uh, granted, yeah. I can see the appeal. What's scary? I, you know, I don't know if the scary is the right word, but I can certainly see the appeal of how music is drawing in younger crowds and then also i haven't seen a lot of them but i watched another video and they started kind of tying in uh some gifts like healing and things like that and so i could see some of the danger i don't know if danger is the right word but i could see how you could mix some of the gnar or just charismatic influence into the music and just through yeah you could you can mix yeah, mix anything in yeah, there. I can yeah, I can see where it's a doorway into that into those thought processes and how it could potentially uh, be abused. But having said all that, I, I think personally, you know, I'm so grounded in my faith, I can I can still enjoy the music and not feel like I'm being brainwashed or or like the you know the piper leading the children out. You know, I don't feel like I'm. It's just great see, now, music. Now you may. Now you make me want to listen to it just to, to sort of, you know, have that conspiratorial perspective. But again, I I, I am so unmusical. I, I get mocked all the time at home because like I have like 11 songs on my iTunes, my, my iPhone. And, yeah. you know, it's just, it, it, you know, the, they could pass, a, you know, the, the, the nation could pass a law outlaw, outlawing music in church and I wouldn't bat an eye, you know, it's just that, that that's too kind of the way it is. But. Yeah, I don't listen to worship music either. And uh, let me tell you, I loved it. I, you know, from the limited sample that I took, and I, you know, I know people, some criticize about their lyrics and whatnot. I get all that, but I'm spiritually mature enough to know what's what. And having said that, all things being equal, I can enjoy worship music. And even if they're introducing some NAR stuff or whatever it might be, if you don't agree with, I can still appreciate it because they're so it's not like. It's not like baptizing a Madonna song. Is that, you know, and I've actually heard, <laughs> I get my kids reporting to me stuff they've heard, like that was so-and-so's song. And I heard that before I knew what that song was and it was in church. What are they doing? And so it's not like that. No, no, this is all uh, original. Okay. Cause again, I'm not, 
I'm not musically informed enough to to know if my kids are just making you know yanking my chain or if they're like alarmed and telling me that you're, you know then this isn't this isn't our church this isn't you know where we go to, to uh, Grace and Bellingham but you know my, my kids tend to go to lots of different things you know youth rallies and groups and whatnot and I've heard some strange stuff. <laughs> Just put yeah. it that way. Yeah. And so that's why I'm interested about this whole NAR conversation. And hopefully uh, uh, Dr. Brown can um, squash some of the fears that we have out there. Because after seeing the music, I, I love it. But I get, you know, I say the same way people poo poo Joe Olstein. You know, I'll listen to some of his stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I love that stuff. That's right. You know, amen. And it makes you, makes you feel good. Yeah. And, and, and there's a place <laughs> and a time for all of that stuff. Well, I'm expecting Mike to be halfway between Holly and me <laughs> you know, or something like that. Or I'll, no, I'm going to be, I'll put it the other way around. I'm going to be halfway between Holly and Mike. Yeah. That, that, that's the, that's the correct way to put it. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad that he uh, has decided, you know, to, to come on board here and, and talk to us. So we should, uh, we should get him up here now and begin the discussion. Well, it's great to have uh, Michael Brown on the Naked Bible Podcast. I've been on Mike's show a couple of times, and he's been very kind and, and, and gracious helping to promote Unseen Realm and just, you know, just have some good discussion about uh, biblical theology, the biblical text. And, you know, didn't didn't really imagine, you know, I'd, I'd get you uh, on this show, Mike, uh, you know, as, as quickly as this, but I think the circumstances are good, you know, to help further the discussion, have a a sort of a balance to the, the earlier interview with Holly. And just thanks for being on here. My joy to be with you. Yeah, great. Hey, I, I, want, every, I want everybody to hear a part of the email I sent to Mike, you know, as, as preparation for this. I gave him a heads up, you know, after the, the earlier interview, since he was mentioned uh, in that interview. And again, I've, I've known Mike for a while. We've only, we've met for about seven seconds face to face in a Dallas <laughs> airport. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we've, we've spent time corresponding with each other. And, of course, I, I was on his, his show as well. So I wanted to give him a heads up. But here's part of what I, I sent to him. Uh, I have some personal thoughts in here and then sort of to help him, help give him some context for what we wanted to do here. And I wrote, uh, the NAR has a lot of wackiness going on, but also a lot of sincere people uh, in it. Holly admitted the latter, although, you know, it was pretty brief because she thinks the wider, you know, thing, movement, is dangerous. I think she has a point, but I'm also sure there are a lot of good people who are touched by this in some way that don't give the organizational structure or agenda a second or even a first thought. For me, the dangers are, number one, the authority claims related to networks of churches. Number two, theonomy talk, which is certainly not isolated to the New Apostolic Reformation. And three, defining one's relationship with God by gift performance versus character and faithfulness. I've seen the latter destroy people personally uh, more than once. Historically, we've sort of seen number two happen, you know, the, the theonomic idea. Uh, Church-state marriages don't work out terribly well. In a nutshell, I have a low view of people who use the Bible or the cross to manipulate others or who conflate the kingdom of God with political power and influence. But I don't really care too much about the gifting issues. Uh, I have problems with some of the gift talk, like how you can hold classes to teach people how to do miraculous kinds of gifts, which I don't see uh, in the New Testament, or that techniques of spiritual warfare involve things like dancing and hit, you know, using tambourines and whatnot. And I, I actually did see that a few days ago. But I'm, I'm quite open. You know, God can do what he wants, when he wants, and with who he wants to do it. Uh, so I, I'm not your your classic cessationist. Uh, I, I actually don't think that the terms mean a whole lot uh, anymore. They they just don't allow nuancing. Now we we got into this. That's essentially the end of what I what I sent to Mike. We got into this a little bit in this past week's live stream. Uh, I did a live stream with my friend Rich Baker. We were at a, a coffee house in town. And Rich has been in the major uh, NAR and charismatic conferences uh, and lots of churches associated with both. NAR as you know, they would affiliate with NAR in some way, or those who don't. And, you know, he, he actually helped organizationally with some of those. And so he, he knows some of the major figures and talked, you know, really positively about them. So if, if you haven't watched the live stream, you should. He's also seen a lot of crazy stuff, uh, but also a lot of good people, you know, who want to serve the Lord and are actively doing so right now. 
and I'm the same, though my experience is limited. This audience knows, of course, I spent a lot of time, you know, in what I affectionately call Christian Middle Earth. And within that orbit, there are a lot of people who would be, you know, in the charismatic circle. Uh, most of them would probably not have heard of the, the NAR because I've actually asked a few and gotten blank expressions a lot. Um, but, you know, I enjoy them. And I, I, I like my time in Middle Earth. And you've heard me talk about this before. I, I might you know, be talking to a person and think that the idea they're asking me to consider doesn't have a prayer of being correct. But if they're not harming the gospel, if they're not diluting it, defaming it, direct, you know, driving people away from, from faith and preaching another gospel, their heart's in the right place. You know, I'm, I'm just not going to rain on, on their parade. I'm not going to, you know, create an antagonistic sort of relationship. The, the thing that really, again, concerns me is, is when people take something they're, they're passionate about and they, they elevate it to the level of the gospel or they force it on other people. Well, I'm not going to name, name a name here, but I know of someone who, uh, you know, was, was doing a, a, a TV show, uh, a show that is absolutely, uh, you know, having you know, really important figures from the New Apostolic Reformation on it. And right before the show, the, the host uh, ambushed this guy and said, well, I can't have you on unless you speak in tongues. And so he, the, the guy like peppered him, well, just say this and say that, you know, do these syllables and that, and, you know. And, and the guy felt cornered and he just, you know, blathered something. Okay, you're good now. That, that's just aberrant doctrine. That's spiritual abuse. It, it, this wasn't me personally because my answer would have been, well, then you can fill my empty chair because we're done here. Um, that's the kind of thing that I don't like to see. I, I, I care that, you know, people aren't lorded over. And, and I, I don't want to see doctrine shelved in favor of experience, but that isn't to deny that God can do things experientially. So we wanted to have, you know, Mike on because he, he is, you know, linked into this tradition in some way, but I want to let him sort of tell us what that means. So as we get started here, Mike, what, you know, how would you define all this stuff? I mean, what, what is the NAR uh, to you and, and how do you articulate the difference between that term and Pentecostals, Charismatics, Vineyard, you know, you know, any other you know, adjective you, you care to throw, throw in here. Yeah, sure thing. And it's great, great to have this time to talk. When I was a boy, uh, we traveled across country as a family, my sister and I, my mom and dad. And I remember we were in Texas and my dad ordered a New York cut steak. And I remember he said, I've lived in New York all my life and I've never seen a New York cut steak. In other words, in Texas, they thought there was such a thing. But as a lifetime New Yorker, he never heard of it. So uh, commonly, when people attack me about the, the, the NAR or whatever, uh, and, uh, and charismatic Pentecostal circles, which I've been in for the better part of the last 46 years, no one's heard of it. No one knows what in the world you're talking about. So this idea that there is this thing that, that's controlling all these churches, a DVD just came out and said they have oversight over 300 million people worldwide. That's a complete myth. That's basically like the Nephilim or the Illuminati, and, the, and they rule everything, and Michael Heiser is the honorary president of the whole thing. Uh, I <laughs> no, mean, no, I'm, I'm a Jesuit. Get it right. Oh, Mike. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay. Now, I mean, I get called everything day and night. I am, by the way, an apostle and a leader in the NAR, and then my great sin is that I deny it on top of it. <laughs> so, and anyway, as uh, let me say a few things. Number one, uh, the charismatic movement spreading around the world is the greatest uh, harvest of souls in the history of of uh, the church in terms of numbers of people coming to faith around the world. Many church historians, missiologists will attest to that. Number two, there are lots of abuses, lots of errors, especially as it spread very rapidly. And if you're in, say, a, a kind of a Baptist tradition, Presbyterian churches, a lot of the abuses will be spiritual deadness, spiritual coldness. <laughs> A lot of the abuses in the charismatic side will be loud, outward spiritual abuses. So those exist. I can tell you what I've written to address abuses about a book I have coming out next year that addresses abuses. I'll gladly tell you about that. But when it comes to, quote, the, the NAR, as I understand this, this is associated with Dr. Peter Wagner. Mm -hmm. Now, long before I ever heard of Peter Wagner, I concluded based on scripture that there were small a apostles and prophets that continued to minister based on Ephesians 4, based on 1 Corinthians 12. 
and that they've been with us through church history, even if we didn't call people by that name. You know, in my mind, a Hudson Taylor would have been an apostolic leader going to plant a new territories and a, and a, a spiritual father that gave birth to many other works. And, and there, there are people, I'll, I'll look at a man like Al Mohler, who's a non-charismatic as being a prophetic voice in the body today. And, and again, he's a, he's a non-charismatic, perhaps even anti in that way. So I believe those things just based on my study of scripture and the different circles where I traveled spiritually, many people le- believed in those. And then Peter Wagner, who's a fuller prof and very influential, began to write on this. And apparently, because I didn't read a lot of the stuff, pointed to a certain point in time of, of a transformation and and that God was now raising up apostles, etc. So I guess that when people talk about the NAR, they're talking about that specific thing. But the guys that I've been friends with over the years, uh, like Cheon or Lou Engel or Mike Bickle, that are allegedly part of the NAR, first, I never heard any of them talk about being part of that thing. That's the first thing. Second thing, none of uh, there's nobody I know in the charismatic movement, nobody I've worked with for decades that's a theonomist. I've never heard the talk in all my years being in these circles. Uh, the great majority are not post-millennial. The great majority are pre-millennial. Many are dispensational. That's the tradition a lot of us got saved out of. And even some of the things you talk about, like going on Christian TV and they had them speak in tongues. I mean, I've been on Christian TV many times. I have several shows on Christian TV. One of my friends just took over God TV. Uh, I've got plenty of friends that have Christian programs. I I can't imagine any of us ever doing that in a million years or the question ever coming up. Now, there are all kinds of beauty. Some of the craziest, wackiest stuff is on charismatic TV, and it's I'm, I'm ashamed of it. It's miserable. And some of the fundraising is, is all messed up, and I've yeah. written about it and speak out. It, but it's embarrassing. No question. I'm not minimizing that. But the, the only thing, this last introductory point, the only real abuse – or abuses that I've seen among those who associate with various, quote, apostolic movements. I think there are several or many, I think. But one is the idea that you that everybody needs to have an apostle over them. And I think what that comes from is you have a ton of independent charismatic churches that have no denominational affiliation. So there's no order. There's no sense of accountability. There are no senior leaders to go to. And there's no network to connect to. So I think it tries to meet that need, which is is fine in terms of just looking for spiritual elders. But the other side of it is I've seen that Peter Wagner rightly addressed the issue of the sola pastora kind of thing, that the pastor is everything, that's the only real gift today, that the pastor is supposed to do everything, and that the way we run our church is just kind of a one-man show. I agreed with that, but then it seemed that what he was saying was like, if, if you have more than one church, then you're an apostle. Everybody became an apostle. And everybody put, the, you know, not everybody, but tons of people started to identify as apostles. And I thought that was an abuse that I have always differed with. So that that's that's my introductory response to a lot of yeah, what that, you've that, put out. That, that's interesting because, you know, the couple things there, um, and I'll try to remember to go back to, to the one to ask a question, but w- what you just described Wagner as reacting to, see, that that was what I grew up in the, the sort of one man show kind of thing. And, and, you know, I, I want to be clear here again, my, my initial, you know, spiritual tradition when I came to the Lord as a teenager was uh, fundamentalism. And you see a lot of, of that kind of thing where nothing can happen in the church unless it crosses over my desk, you know, that, that sort of, you know, leadership. But, but I want to be clear. I, I look back on, on my past uh, in those things. And I think that it had more benefits than liabilities, uh, you know, as far as my, you know, my own spiritual upbringing. But I, I did see things like that, that I came to view as heavy handed and, you know, just spiritual abuse. I mean, I could, I could go a long time with a, with a lot of stories, you know, like that. So, you know, if, if you're framing Wagner, like, he, cause I haven't read, you know, see Peter Wagner either. You know, I mean, why, why would I go out and read charismatic guys if I'm in this other, you know, other strain of Christianity? Um, but if that's what he's reacting to, yeah, that deserves a, a, a reaction and a, and a rebuke. I mean, I would, I would certainly agree with that. And it, it probably is part of why I um, really, I, I, I take the priesthood of the believer pretty seriously. 
Um, I, I don't, I don't see the need to have a hierarchy of men telling us things that the spirit of God could just prompt us to do just fine by himself. Uh, in other words, I, 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 I really, I have on my radar a lot, uh, people and I, you know, since movements are composed of people movements as well that seem to want to try to do the Holy Spirit's job for him, not with him. And, and so I, I, I tend to react to that pretty strongly because I've just seen, there's just a, there's a trail of wreckage, you know, behind that approach to ministry. And it doesn't really matter what label goes on it. Um, and I'm not surprised at all that you've, you've seen that sort of thing. I, I know I have. So that I'm glad to hear. Um, but the thing that, that other thing you said that sort of popped a question in my head was you brought up the fundraising. It, is there a relationship between this is like a Venn diagram, I, I realize here, but I don't, I don't know what the proportions are, but prosperity gospel, is, is that a subset of something within the charismatic movement? Is it, is it something that you would associate with the NAR or it's independent of that? I mean, what, give us the Venn diagram of, of, you know, the, these kind of terms, because I'm, I'm quite unfamiliar with sure. all of that. Yeah, I, I think I can help there. Okay, no, number one, remember, that I have a real hard time telling you what is NAR and who's part of it. Uh, right. And, and again, I, I simply, I, I don't know. I don't know that it's right. that Un unless fine. somebody, unless somebody says, Hey, we're, we're on this bandwagon. How would you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or, or look again, there are lots of leaders that I work with and some of them, some of my friends would, would identify, you know, or they really look to, to Dr. Wagner, Peter Wagner, they respect it a lot and, and so on. And, but, I, I never knew them to say that they were part of that thing. So if it's more clearly defined for some, so be it. But no, the the fundraising abuses are more of a kind of a classic charismatic thing that may even go back to the healing revival of the 40s and 50s when men like Oral Roberts and, and T.L. Osborne and you know their ministries came to, to national attention. But with that there were some abuses from different ones. And I think that's been kind of a, a manipulative thing that's found in some charismatic circles because you believe in the man of God and you believe on the anointing in the man of God. And, and, and we are people of faith and we step out, but I've not seen that. Like all the guys I know that, that say worked in Peter Wagner circles, which let's, let's put it like that. If that's what NAR is fine. Okay. But uh, let's just say they associate it with Peter Wagner circles. No, none of them, have been guilty of that, nor do they, are they primarily associated with the prosperity message. That came out specifically of the Word of Faith movement that would be associated with Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland and people like Creflo Dollar today. So and, what, what is that movement in relationship to, the, is that a subset of the charismatic yes, thing? Yes, sub, okay. subset of, of charismatic, that's one. Uh, not related to NAR, again, as far as I can define it and understand it, uh, but but uh, in countries like Africa has been a prominent part of the charismatic movement, although African leaders have told me there's a lot of course correction being made now. Um, in America, it's definitely a subset. Uh, but he here's, here are the strengths and the weaknesses. The strengths are that a lot of the message reacted against kind of a poverty mentality that there was never any money for the gospel that there was never money to fund the gospel, that the way that you honored the pastor or the leader was by depriving them of income so that they were always short on money. And the joke when I, when I got saved was that, you know, the pastor's so holy, he has hole in his, holes in his shoes. Mm -hmm. And that there, the, all the verses, you know them from the Old Testament, that associate the blessing of God with earthly riches, or it, all through the Proverbs, uh, that, that as we honor the Lord with our first fruits, that he honors us. That it would take these verses, and then verses in the New Testament, that God will make us rich in every way, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the words of Jesus about giving it will be given to you, and things like that. And taught principles of generosity, which are great. Taught principles as give, support the gospel, underwrite missions worldwide. That's tremendous. Some of these Word of Faith guys are incredibly generous and have given millions of dollars to the gospel. The weakness is it was totally tied in with a carnal mentality. Uh, that Jesus died to make me rich, that physical riches are, are a sign of spirituality, that, that if you really follow Jesus, you won't be poor. 
So some real aberrant teachings in it, and then some other disturbing things about atonement and stuff, so that there, there's some that put word of faith, like a Hank Hanegraaff would put word of faith in the camp of, of heresy. Uh, and uh, I, I, I joined in every year at the Southern Evangelical Seminary. They do an annual apologetics conference near Charlotte, North Carolina, that draws thousands of people. And they will often have seminars on word of faith being, being heretical, just like Mormons are heretical. Most of the word of faith people I knew have been clear born-again believers who held to the fundamentals of the gospel, but who had uh, an error in terms of earthly riches being a sign of spirituality. Now, that word of faith message then ties in with different types of carnal fundraising. You know, the Lord showed me the number 777, and if you give $777 and sow it into our ministry today, you'll get a hundredfold return over the next year. That kind of nonsense. And that's why we, we it's an ugly abuse. I agree with the critics of it. I make no excuses for it, but I don't associate it particularly with with NAR guys at all. None of them that I know of are are into that. Well, I think that's really uh, helpful. It's helpful for me. It's helpful, I think, for our audience as well, because I, like I said, I'm just, I'm I'm way out of this orbit. And and when you're way out of the orbit, you know, everything that you hear, you know, it tends to be, it's easy pickings. It tends to be all the the stuff that's abusive. Uh, and whatnot, you know, my own Christian life, you know, I've, I've just come to meet other, you know, other believers that are, you know, charismatic or, you know, not just that, but, you know, they, they believe other things that I wasn't raised to believe. And, you know, sometimes I've ended up changing my mind. Sometimes I haven't, but it's like, you, you just, you appreciate them for their, their hearts in the right place is how I like to say it. So again, I, I know enough, you know, people that, that you're describing just in the broader, you know, charismatic sense that th- this isn't news, uh, you know, to me, most of the ones I know are, are just, you know, fine people. And as far as the, the NAR goes, I mean, you know, there, there, there's somebody writing that, that stuff and there's somebody, you know, writing the material that Holly references and somebody wants it to be a big thing or, or treats it as a big thing. But to be honest with you, again, I, I think, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about what, what are some of the solutions here? But, you know, f- for me, just, just to chime in here, because I want to give Mike most of the time here. Uh, for me, it's like, I think at least one of the solutions is to not pay attention to movements. <laughs> um, that's a little self-serving because I don't, but I, I, there are lots of reasons why I don't. But I, I just think, look, if, if we're, we're trying to learn scripture, we're trying to develop as disciples, we're trying to do ministry, you know, we, we, we have churches that we go to, you know, we, we find like-minded people within those churches. We hopefully are mature enough to realize that, you know, no church I go to is going to just, you know, thrill me in every way. And that might be an opportunity to be the thing that I see missing, or at least I can find a few people again, that are like-minded and, and, you know, enjoy, you know, fellowship with them, maybe in certain ways that I can't with other people, whatever. But, you know, to me, it's just a mistake to define your relationship with the Lord and what the Lord would have you do both on a daily basis and sort of in, in taking the big picture look, you know, in terms of, you know, how, how you can be salt and light to as many people as possible within the span of your lifetime, that doesn't need to be filtered through a movement. And so I, I, I just think that we would be a lot wiser if we kind of focused on our own relationship with the Lord and the people that, that are there to partner with us and just, you know, do things that need to get done and, and not, and again, filter, you know, things and not, not be about fostering or furthering this particular group or movement or set of initials or whatever it is. And it, I'll grant that that's easy for me to do. I know it might not be easy for other people to do, but I, I don't know, Mike, you know, what do you, what do you think about, what do you do just, I guess, intentionally to address the problems and then just sort of setting all of it aside, you know, what, what, what's your, your advice to people just living their life and, and trying to do something for the kingdom of God? I mean, how would you, how would you talk to somebody about that? Yeah. First, that's where it all starts. It's, it's our own relationship with God, understanding who we are as his children, loved, forgiven in the Messiah, called to serve him, called to revere him and be disciples and make disciples. And I only perceive myself as being part of the Jesus movement, the worldwide Jesus movement. So I have dear friends who are charismatic all around the world. I have dear friends who are non-charismatic. 
And I've worked with people for years and didn't even know if they were charismatic or not because we mm -hmm. worked together for the cause of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting. I, I just pulled something up Peter Wagner wrote in 2011. And he said, the NAR is not an organization. No one can join or carry a card. It has no leader. I've been called the founder, but this is not the case. One reason I might be seen as an intellectual godfather is that I might have been the first to observe the movement, give a name to it, and describe its characteristics as I saw them. When this began to come together through my research in 1993, I was a professor of church growth at Fuller Theological Seminary, where I taught for 30 years. The roots of the NAR go back to the beginning of the African Independent Church Movement in 1900, the Chinese House Church Movement beginning in 1976, the U.S. Independent Charismatic Movement beginning in the 1970s, and the Latin American Grassroots Church Movement beginning around the same time. I was neither the founder nor a member of any of these movements. I was simply a professor who observed that they were the fastest growing churches in their respective regions and that they had a number of common characteristics so that they were not – now this is me – not mm -hmm. part of a particular denomination. You know, he, he used post-denominational. That didn't work. So he tried to just come up with a way to describe what he was seeing. So again, it's, it's something that's organic in that respect and that just different churches that function with different understanding than having a uh, centralized uh, uh, headquarters and look more in terms of an organic reproducing movement and that were charismatic. That's what he was, that's what he was classifying. But back to, back to the individual level, it's interesting that, that when I had Bill Johnson on my radio show, I got a lot of criticism. Of course, a lot of people love him, and I got a lot of criticism for it. And he agreed to come on the show and, and be asked hard questions. I, I especially put out invitations to those who were critical of Bethel to call in with their criticisms. And some things I asked him because no one called, but that was critical. They just had other questions. So what, I raised certain questions to him about practices. He goes, no, we don't believe that. We repudiate it. We heard some people were doing it. We teach against it. I said, okay, what about this quote? He goes, yeah, that's, that's my son or son-in-law. He goes, that, that was a misstatement, and uh, we regret that he said it. He's corrected it. Okay, how about this? Yeah, that was my daughter, and she doesn't use that. In other words, he was totally honest and said, yeah, I wouldn't have said it like that. I don't agree, and responded in a mature, godly way. What's fascinating, though, is one of my friends spent time – with their students in their ministry school there. And he said their big emphasis was not gifts, but identity in Jesus and being a son or daughter of God, not being, I have this gift, or I have that gift, or I have this calling, or I have that calling. And that that grounded them in security so that there was no competition. You're not being measured by how much you're producing or whether you can heal the sick or prophesy. You're not being measured by a title associated with your name. Rather, your identity is found as being a son or daughter of God. And with that identity, now you joyfully serve him in whatever capacity he calls you to. Now, there's where, certain things. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was going to Go say, where, and where, where did you read that or hear that? Where did you get that information, that specifically? One of my colleagues uh, spent some time visiting uh, the, the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, mm -hmm. and he wanted to see what they were doing. Uh, he was faculty member at our own ministry school. He uh, roomed with some of the students just to, to see what they were thinking. He mm -hmm. went out to meals with them. And what he saw, and again, there's certain emphases there I'm sure I, I disagree with. Uh, I, I disagree with, I feel there's a lack of understanding of the role of Israel, some other things. And I'm sure uh, as all of us talk, we're, we're going to have areas of disagreement. That's That's normal within the body. We each have strengths and weaknesses. But what he found was that there wasn't a sense of competition uh, or a sense of earning something or proving something, rather a security grounded in being in Christ, our primary identity being sons and daughters of God, and that you, we're, on a, we're on a mission. Wherever we go, we're on a mission to share Jesus. Do you happen to remember what year that was? Is that, was that pretty recent? Uh, no, he, he went over there, oh, I would say oh, probably – six, seven, eight years ago, but I've had other friends that have been involved there over the years. I, th I think that's pretty steady emphasis. I think that's one of the foundations. Here, here's, here's why I'm asking, you know, it, it, it seems to me, and again, I'm, I, I'm not conversant with any literature that says one way or the other, but it seems to me that, that people like him, you know, the, the higher ups that would be associated with the NAR, they have got to know that, you know, they've got to know about the abuses. They've got to know about the criticism being levied against them. 
if it was me, I would think, well, we need to produce a book. We need to produce something that articulates just exactly what you just described. And if nothing like that exists, I'd like to know why. Like, in other words, why are they not making this clear to both their critics and also to people who are participating within the movement? Because if, if you don't hear that, you know, about the, like, the competition and all that kind of stuff, if you don't hear those kinds of things that you need to hear, well, of course, you know, you, you're going to have people just veer off into all these areas. And it's interesting you use the word competition because, again, without naming any groups or anything like that, that my, my one of my again I have very few experiences with something that would would directly where where people would tell me that we're part of this that or the other thing, but that was a big deal, it, on, in a, in a negative sense. It it just became a a kind of a cycle of gifted one upsmanship, and it, and if you didn't come across as a certain kind of person. If you didn't present yourself in a certain way, if you didn't, you know, exercise these quote unquote gifts, then there was just something wrong with you, you know, and, and it, that's the kind of thing that, that really operates in a, in a vicious circle because, okay, I'm, I'll do this thing and I'll smile a lot and I'll, you know, whatever. And I saw this in fundamentalism has, that had nothing to do with charismatic stuff. You, you, there was a certain sort of there's a kind of litmus test, you know, what what we look for in someone who's, quote, committed, you know, to Jesus, okay, really on fire for Jesus. And you, you start checking the, the, the things off, and then something else will come along that'll strike somebody's fancy. And then, well, I got to add that to my bag of tricks. I got I to gotta make sure people identify me with this thing, this new behavior over here. And it, it it's like a death spiral you know, to some yeah, people. Yeah. It's just, you know, it, I, I, why, why aren't they, or are they making this clear? Uh, okay. Uh, Cause it would uh, be great for, for everybody to hear what you just said. I mean, we don't have that big of an audience here, but yeah. I mean, it, it would be great to just set that record straight, you know, articulate something. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to say may surprise you, okay. but I doubt that Bill Johnson and these other guys are even aware that they're criticized in some of these ways. Uh, I, I think it's so foreign to them and so out there. Do you know how many times I have to defend you from being a heretic? I just got another link to email <laughs> forwarded to me. Uh, you, you may know about this because your area of scholarship, et cetera, but I'm serious. I just get someone else writing to me about your dangerous yeah. beliefs, yeah. et cetera. Now, you may know some about this, but the reason you may not clarify certain things, as a scholar, you would. I mean, you and I tend to think ahead of what objections are going to be raised. And I'm not saying this, I am saying this, but most of these guys are completely oblivious to the attacks coming their way. You said, well, they should know. You have to understand most of the, of the critics that are the loudest are so extreme and so ugly. I, one guy attacked me the other day and it was just forwarded to me. That's how I saw it. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, you are more dangerous than ISIS terrorists. And when I reached out to him and said, and I decided I'm, I'm, I'm older than him. I'm going to reach out. I said, hey, I, I appreciate you being sincere. I think I can help you. He said, if you don't repent of your charismatic beliefs, you're going to burn in the fires of hell. So yeah. the stuff is so idiotic, so far-fetched that they don't even bother with it. In other words, one of the values is you don't respond to critics because you just look at it as destructive. And it's so ugly and so misrepresentative. Why should I respond to something I don't even believe? Why should I repudiate something that, that has nothing to do with me? So that's one thing. The second thing is, from what I know, that's a primary message that comes out of Bethel about being secure in the love of God. I think that's the primary message that Bill Johnson's written on for years. I've only read snippets of his books, but I'm almost sure that's a major theme, the love of God and being secure in him, and your identity is found in Jesus, not performance. But the last thing is, the performance question is a big problem through the whole body for many. You'll yeah. find in, in fundamentalist Baptist circles and in radical charismatic circles, and that tends to be a, a works mentality that if I didn't have a good day and pray enough, God doesn't love me as much. And if I prayed mm -hmm. more, he loves me more. And in fact, I, I see a reaction against that that goes too far in what I've written about called hyper grace. And say that the primary leader associated that with that would be Joseph Prince. And he and I have dialogue face to face. And his whole thing would be when you know that you know that you're forgiven by grace 
and established in grace, you're going to be holy and love God with all of your heart. That's the response of love because he says, you know, sin is destructive and holiness is, is beautiful. But the way to get it is not by hitting people over the head with the Bible, but by preaching the love of God to them. And I would say amen, but it, it's swung too far. So I think that's a message. Some people have accused Bethel of being hyper grace as well. And, and I, don't, I don't know that they'd be familiar with that term. It's not something that they used, but there is a strong emphasis that your acceptance comes from what Jesus did, not what you do. And then based on that, now as an accepted believer who's found rest, now we run and seek to do the will of God. But look, there's always a maturity. There is always pressure that someone's going to feel to conform. Mm -hmm. uh, there are things we do unconsciously that, that can create that. I'm sure some of the messages I've preached calling people, lay down your life for the gospel, give yourself to the Lord. They felt some kind of pressure to perform through that. So we, we all have to do our best to ground people in grace and then from that place of grace, call them to serve. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I, I would agree. It, it's just, it's just this ubiquitous problem. It is. <laughs> you know, that, that, that Christians everywhere are just plagued. And they can, they can, they can spit the gospel back to you and, and get it right. You know, they can, they can pass the exam, so to speak. But then they're just so they struggle so much with how God looks at them, you know, based on performance issues, you know, sins of omission and commission and all that sort of thing. Yep. Yeah, that's a huge problem. Um, boy, yeah, we could we could spend a lot of time on that. All right. Well, what? Go ahead. Where Where else would you like to to take the conversation in particular? We'll We'll give you you know sort of a free reign here. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, a few things, um, a specific, and someone had sent this to me before you were kind enough to do it, uh, something that, that Holly had mentioned. Now, we're, we're going to reach out to her to have her on my show. I'm, I'm not questioning her sincerity. It's just when you present things to the people involved and they can't even recognize it, I, I think something's amiss there. And perhaps sometimes as outsiders, we don't really understand rightly what's happening on the inside. That's why it's always important to say, hey, have I represented you accurately? Have I understood you accurately? And from the things coming back to me, I, I question that. But she had thought that I taught once at Wagner Leadership Institute um, and then said, no, she was mistaken. I taught mm -hmm. elsewhere. Well, I've, I've taught at, at seven different seminaries from, from Fullerton to Denver Theological Seminary to Trinity to some of the finest seminaries in, in the nation. I had the joy of doing that. Uh, I did teach years back. Uh, once, I believe once, may have been twice at the Wagner Leadership Institute. Uh, so she was right in thinking I did. She wrongly corrected herself. But that's not a training place for here's how you learn how to be an apostle. Or here, no, rather, Peter Wagner had a lot of issues as a professor at Fuller for decades with a lot of the accreditation associations and a lot of their requirements and their lack of recognizing practical ministry as part of your learning and training. So maybe mm -hmm. you pastored for 30 years, but you came into seminary as, as, as if it was just from ground zero. So mm -hmm. he tried to come up with a way to accommodate people's schedules more, as, as I understand it. I was never part of the planning or anything, just, just taught it once, once or twice. But it was to have a network where you'd have all different cities, intensive modulars, taught by recognized professors. And then within that, they would have their own accrediting, their own accountability in terms of, of academic credentials and classes. And you would get certain amount of credit for years of mm -hmm. pastoral experience if you were working towards a D-man or something like that. And if I, if I remember, I, I taught on revival, uh, revival in history, what revival is biblically, uh, keys to seeing revival. Uh, but I, I never knew of a class where they teach you how to be an apostle. Or they teach you how to be a prophet. Or this is specific to quote NAR. You would have been at home in many of the classes. Those that were more charismatically oriented might have been a, a bit foreign. But otherwise, it would have been, yeah, good stuff like they teach at seminaries. They're just making it more uh, fitting where someone's not in a full-time program the same way or having to deal with the rigors of a regular schedule. So, so that, again, is, is kind of a, a bogus I idea. And the, I think the biggest thing that, that your listeners need to grasp is that 
around the world for the last hundred plus years, there has been a growing movement of people who believe speaking in tongues is for today, who believe that healing and miracles are for today. And uh, according, again, to major church historians, there's a, a new series coming out from, from Oxford, Modern Church Studies, and the second volume is called To the Ends of the Earth, and it's about the worldwide growth of the Pentecostal movement. I have a volume that, that Life magazine put out in the year 1999 of the thousand greatest people, excuse me, the hundred greatest people and events of the last, uh, the last 100 years, and I believe, excuse me, the 100 greatest people and events of the last thousand years. That's what it was for the, mm-hmm. for the millennium from 1000 to 2000. And I think number 68 was the modern Pentecostal outpouring. So you're talking about something that it spread massively and that for the, for the most part does not have a specific denominational affiliation. Uh, for the most part does not just have a, you know, you don't have a Pope over it or anything like that. And Mm -hmm. some groups within that Peter Wagner would have identified as having similar characteristics. But you have house church movements that are uh, charismatic and Pentecostal. You have some that that use liturgy that are, you know, much more classic. And the pastor gets Mm -hmm. up there and he's called a priest and he wears a robe. Uh, You have others who are, you know, uh, old kind of camp meetings. So it's it's very broad and wide. But all of them would agree on the fundamentals of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, all of them would agree, except for little groups that, that are aberrant, that are not part of the mainstream, with, with the authority of Scripture. And I have a chapter in my book, Authentic Fire, that I wrote in response to John MacArthur's strange fire called Sola Scriptura and Therefore Charismatic. So uh, for me, my experience has confirmed things I believe. But I, I believe in, in divine healing. I believe in gifts being for today, not primarily based on what I experience, but primarily based on what's written. Yet I know many who identify as cessationists who used to be charismatic and had bad experiences because mm-hmm. of which they denied things. And I said, well, you're telling me I'm basing things on experience. I'm basing them on the word. And, and you had a bad experience, so you changed your beliefs. So can we look at what the word says? And that's that's my big issue. The extreme critics, the ones like John MacArthur, who, who obviously uh, has done great good and, and is a man who's not been associated with scandals and is a serious teacher of the word and a great example in many ways, but profoundly differ with him on, on certain points, respectfully so, as, as he's an elder to me, uh, he would say the vast majority of charismatics worldwide are not saved at all, that there's no healthy baby in the bathwater that in the strange conference, strange fire conference, uh, when when he was asked a question head on, he said, "We're not dividing the body; we're trying to identify the body." So that to me is very disturbing. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and when people look at the worldwide, what, what's the basis? What's the basis for a claim like that? I've not read Strange Fire. I, I read years and years, what, what is it, thirty years now? His original book, uh, Charismatics. I had to read it for a class. Um, but I've not read this recent thing. Is this a, a totally new book or is it like a rehash of the old one or you know, what? There's some rehash, but it's it's a totally new book. And what happened was, as he explained it, that, that he had back surgery and was laid up for a while and ended up watching a lot of Christian TV. And that's uh, <laughs> wow. that's what – that's what prompted. Now, thankfully, there are. I guess are, I can't blame him. <laughs> I, I, listen, I can't. I can't either. But you have to remember, I'm in this. I travel mm-hmm. around the world, and I don't see these abuses. In other words, it's the rarest of rare for every bad experience I've had, where someone's been abusive with finances, or it has been some spiritual prima donna, and wants to stay in you know the penthouse so suite in the hotel. Yeah, you're, you're I've never worked. for every for every crazy you know you know, charismatic TV show, you know, 50 churches that aren't doing that. Or, or, or a hundred or a thousand. Now here's the negative. A lot of them still watch the guys and are interested. And and maybe this principle will will be helpful to you. When I wrote an authentic fire, uh, I I had a chapter about spirit and truth, uh, word and power, left brain, right brain, and different ways of thinking of things. John MacArthur looks at the abuses as being so extreme. He looks at them as being uh, so manipulative financially. 
uh, believing in false prophecies, uh, teaching things that are that are aberrant, that he cannot see these people being truly born again. Uh, that I, I hope I'm I'm summarizing that position correctly. Now, as far as I know, he views me as a brother. In his book, uh, 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 Strange Fire, he actually quoted from my 1991 book, Whatever Happened to the Power of God, which asked the question, is the charismatic church slain in the spirit or down for the count? So I've, I've been an internal critic, and I have a book coming out next year called Playing with Holy Fire. So I, I am an internal critic. If, if someone mm -hmm. is saying who's raising their voice, I have, and, and I am, and, and I will, and point the first finger at myself for self-examination. But here's what struck me. We each have strengths and weaknesses as human beings and within the body. And that, I think, is part of the richness, uh, the, the richness of the body that we need each other. So uh, if, if some non-charismatic is watching Christian TV and it's one of these corrupt fundraisers and he you know, gets the $777 word, and there's no way this person is going to pick up the phone and call. Com mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Yet. Some charismatic, you know, the wife may turn to the husband and said, honey, I feel this is the Lord. And he said, all right, let's do it. Let's get our last $777. So the, the, the non-charismatic has a strength of being more circumspect and examining things more based on, okay, is this a clear testimony according to Scripture? Charismatic has a weakness of gullibility. Now, let's flip it around. The, the non-charismatic is walking through the mall and sees someone in a wheelchair and feels this strange prompting, I should go pray for this person, that God will heal them. He's not going to do that. That's crazy. Well, the charismatic feels the prompting, goes over, prays for the person. They get healed. Next thing, they're rejoicing there in the mall, and they go tell their non-charismatic friend. Non-charismatic says, I don't believe that. I don't, that obviously, there's another explanation. So the charismatic that has the weakness of gullibility has the strength of stepping out in faith. The non-charismatic who has the, the strength of being circumspect has the weakness of, of being a cynic and being skeptical. Mm -hmm. So that's where I feel we can help each other. That's where I appeal to John MacArthur, rather than writing people off, help them. If the criticism was not so extreme, then you could befriend more people and teach them to do expository preaching like you've done. Uh, teach them to base everything on passages of scripture and not just, you know, an inspirational thought here and there and, and help because there's a massive movement around the world, but much of it is very, very new and very, very young, and therefore need, needs more discipling. But if we think of 1 uh, Corinthians, Paul never wrote off the Corinthians. He said, you don't lack any spiritual gift, and yet they had immorality, they had doctrinal error, they had division, they had carnality. Uh, some people were sick, yeah. others died because of abuses associated with the Lord's table. So I think we need to have the same viewpoint. Thank God for what he is doing. It's wonderful. It's amazing. It's God glorifying around the world. I've seen it with my own eyes on over 150 trips ministering outside of the United States. And where there are abuses, let's do our best to correct them. And let's do our best to learn from each other. Because just like we need scholars, right? Look, look at how Lagos has served the body through making scholarship available in a practical way and eliminated so many exegetical and, and uh, hermeneutical errors, uh, but not everyone's going to be a scholar. And then the scholars need the people, you know, burning to their last breath to take the gospel to the furthest corner of the earth. So we need each other in that regard. No, that's that's well said. I mean, I, I've I've have felt you know conflicted um, about exactly what to do, but I've kind of landed, you know, because of what I, I write, you know, divine counsel, unseen realm, all this kind of stuff. There are a lot of people in the charismatic, you know, orbit that are drawn to that material. And I've had a number of them say, well, this is really helpful because there's this crazy idea over here, but this really helps me sort that out. You know, and I, I'm glad to hear that because my thing is I, I just want to do something useful. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go to this or that event. I'll, you know, go to this or that church. I mean, that, I have a short list of things that I won't do because, you know, like one of these crazy TV shows, you know, cause if you go on that, then it looks like, you know, you're endorsing it or they can use your appearance to endorse themselves, you know, all that stuff. So I, I do have a list of places I won't go, but, but just generally speaking, it's like, if I can go into that context and people who invite me, you know, they'll know because I'll tell them, like, look, this isn't my context. I might not be entirely comfortable with everything, but I'm going to come. 
because I'm going to do something useful. I'm not there to endorse anything, you or anybody else. I'm just there. You, you tell me what you want me to teach, and I'll do that, and hopefully that, that's going to be beneficial. So that that's sort of the position I've adopted, but I, I, I don't necessarily know – how to sort of work that out, you know, how to, how to live that out how, because I don't know the lay of the land. I'm, I'm, I'm learning, you know, I'm, I'm learning a, a few things, you know, along the way, but I have the same kind of attitude. You know, I, I just wish that, you know, Christians would get along, that we would be secure, you know, in the gospel, you know, that this performance thing to me is a huge issue. Um, we're, we're, we're going to disagree. You know, people tell me, you know, Oh, I read this or that, or heard this or saw this YouTube video, this guy get healed, this guy, this, that, is that real? It's like, well, you know, maybe, I mean, how would I know? I'm not omniscient. You know, I, yes, I, because I, I, I have a, a very strong interest in like paranormal stuff. I know stuff can be faked. I know the power of suggestion is absolutely real. I know people can convince themselves of things that are not true. But on the other hand, I've had plenty of contact with people who are, you know, in that sort of orbit or who themselves have experienced this or that. And they're entirely trustworthy. They have no reason to lie to me. And, and it's like, look, I, I'm not going to consider this person a liar. I'm going to assume that God did that. And, and, I, and that's okay with me. You know, I, I, don't, I don't need to, to sort of try to correct God at some point. I'm not going to be disappointed when I get to heaven. And, yeah, yeah, that guy really did heal that guy over there, Mike. You know, you were wrong. I, I mean, that this is God's job. God is his own job description. I'm not going to tread on it. I'm not going to get in its way. Uh, you know, God expects us to evaluate things, um, especially in the world in which we live. There's just a lot of stuff that really isn't, you know, of the Spirit. You know, Scripture itself knows that, you know, there, there are passages where— Paul accuses people of claiming the title apostle and they are false teachers, you know, that, and he actually uses both terms in the same, we, we know that we know mm. that's going to happen. You know, God doesn't expect that we're omniscient. He knows what he's dealing with again. So we need to evaluate, but we also need to let, you know, be open to, to God doing stuff, <laughs> uh, you know, like as, as though his hands are, are tied, you know? And so I come from the, the, the other side where, we felt very comfortable tying God's hands. Yeah, and you know, you know what, and it just shouldn't be. You, you know, it's fascinating in, in in what you say there. So I, I got saved in a little Pentecostal church in 1971 as a heroin shooting LSD using hippie rock drummer, 16 years old, radically born again. My life transformed. Wonderful an encounter with God, rich spiritual life, loving Him, serving Him, sharing the gospel. And over the years in the church, I, I started to get a little skeptical. I, I saw a couple of things that rubbed me the wrong way. I was now starting starting grad school. Uh, I was interacting with a wider part of the body. I began to see that most of the scholars were Calvinists. They weren't charismatic. I began to wonder about the traditions uh, that I was saved in, started to enlarge in my horizons on, in one way that was positive, but in another way fed into an intellectual and theological pride. Because after all, you know, like you, I, I, I got my PhD in Semitic studies and I studied at all secular universities under people who didn't believe what I believed. And, you know, being a tongue speaking Pentecostal is not really sophisticated when you're in grad school. But, you know, holding to the historic orthodox doctrines of Calvinism and, you know, that, that appealed to me more. And I, I'm not critiquing Calvinists. I'm just talking right. about me, my experience. So I actually tried to distance myself from my Pentecostal roots. I remember reading Robert Gromacki's book on the modern tongues movement against it and B.B. Warfield's counterfeit miracles and acquiring other books that attacked charismatic beliefs. And I joined another church uh, that was barely charismatic, if at all. But I couldn't get away from the word said. I, I tried to talk myself out of it and I couldn't scripturally. That was one. And two, when I would really pray and commune with the Lord, it, it only confirmed to me the reality of, of the gifts of the Spirit. And then in, in 1982, as I was working on my doctoral dissertation, which my initial one was on abbreviated verbal idioms in the Hebrew Bible. So, you know, nasa, does it mean to lift the voice? Does it mean to lift a the hand? A bestseller right there. Oh, yeah. Trust me, man. <laughs> the, the, to this day, people groan when I tell them I didn't finish. <laughs> you know, shalach, to send. Does that mean to send messenger? You know, just, yeah. man, it would have been a classic. So I put that down. And, and 
God brought me through a season of personal repentance because of leaving my first love. I was a serious, committed believer. We had the poor and refugees living in our home, but but I'd really left that place of earlier intimacy and faith. And what happened during this time is the Holy Spirit was mightily poured out on me, touched many in our church, and people started getting healed, but they were, in my view, misquoting scripture. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, no, that, that doesn't refer to physical healing. That refers to spiritual healing, and yet they were being healed. So I ended up switching my doctoral dissertation to the root Rafa. That's how it happened, that, that I, I focused all my time on trying to understand what did this Hebrew word mean, restore, heal, what was the root of it, how did it uh, work out in other Semitic languages. So that was my dissertation on the Lord, your healer, a philological study of the root Rafa in the Hebrew Bible and the ancient Near East. And then 10 years later, I did a fresh wave of research, took about 10 or 20 percent uh, from my dissertation. And then wrote a whole volume for Zondervan, which is still in print, called Israel's Divine Healer, which looked at the broader issues and even went into the New Testament as well. So I've been very dogmatic on believing these things to be scriptural, even though healing is not my primary ministry, even though I've, I've prayed for all too many people with cancer and seen them die. But I thoroughly believe that God still heals today, that it, we can come to him with faith and expectation uh, but it's, again, based on – first, I was convicted by what I read, but what jarred my world was seeing God move in undeniable ways. And because I've ministered around the world and have friends around the world, I mean outstanding miracles, even, even resurrections from the dead and people blind for many years. One of my friends ministering in Africa in one single meeting – this, this is a colleague. This is you know known, documented – Three kids in one family that had all gone blind through disease were instantly healed in one meeting. And, and when these things are shared publicly and the people, because the people in the villages, they, wait, we know them. We know their family. We, we've been with them. For, we, were, we carried that cripple in with us. And then Muslims getting up and getting saved. And then you go back there 10 years later and you see the churches are thriving and Jesus is being glorified. Why are we so skeptical? The God who raised the dead, who raised Jesus from the dead, and, and, and the God's given authority to Jesus. So in his name, uh, we go and, and preach and, and, and heal. Why should we question it? This is God moving around the world. To me, we should be rejoicing. And if we see error, then we step in to help. And, you know, last thing, in John 5, Jesus heals the, the lame man, 38 years lame, right? And he tells him, take up your mat and walk. What's the Sabbath? So obviously Jesus did this intentionally, right? There's just like in John 9, the way he heals the blind man uh, violates what, what apparently were Jewish traditions of the day, a couple of them. So when the religious leaders see the man, they've known him crippled for years, right? What's mm -hmm. the first question they ask you? Who told you to pick up the mat? That to me is the mentality of destructive criticism and of dead religious tradition. Instead of saying, whoa, what happened? You're healed. What happened to you? Oh, by the way, you shouldn't carry that mat. You should put it down. But you're healed. What happened? Instead, they didn't ask about the healing. They wanted to know who told you to carry your mat. And I think sometimes we can have that tendency that because something violates my style, the same thing when, when disciples come to Jesus and say, you know, there's a man driving out demons in your name, but he's not one of us. Do we shut him down? And Jesus said, no, you can't work a miracle in my name and then the next minute be against me. So I think sometimes we, and charismatics do it the same way, we can be so narrow that if it's not exactly the way we're used to doing it, then we, 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 we reject it. I think we should rejoice and say, hey, if this is the Lord, wonderful, let's be Berean. If this is the Lord, wonderful, but we'll study and be sure. Oh, and I said last thing, but another last thing. <laughs> I do believe because we use terms apostles, prophets, I should have said this right at the outset. There are potential abuses with that in terms of either authority or lording it over people. Mm -hmm. When they're used and it's just part of the parlance, it's no different than pastor, teacher, evangelist. It's just a descriptive term, and we don't see them as lording it over people. Then it's great. It just gives different aspects to the different ways God uses people today. But if someone thinks apostle, that means I have New Testament apostolic authority, big, big dangerous red flag. If someone yeah. thinks because I'm prophet, I can now tell you the will of God, big, dangerous red flag. So yes, in those circles where those titles exist, there's more possibility of abuse in those ways. But it's something, again, that's an abuse that we address and deal with. It's certainly not part of the mainstream.
Well, I know, I know you have to run. I'm, I'm glad you you summarized that. Uh, before you go, you have a new book. Yes. Out, and I want to give you a chance to mention it. So tell us the title and what it's about real quick. Yes. Uh, Enoch takes on the Nephilim. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I'm still, stole trying to, that. <laughs> still trying to write one that'll sell like some of yours. Okay. Um, it's It just came out last week. It's called Saving a Sick America, a prescription for moral and cultural transformation. It's a book literally about the fall and rise of America, how low we've fallen morally and spiritually, but how through the scripture, we can, as believers, turn back to God and even influence the nation and even to lay out the very real possibility that there could yet be another great awakening ahead and that our best days could even be ahead. So it's called Saving a Sick America. And if folks want to stay in touch with me, we're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, my daily radio show, normally eight to 10 new articles and videos a week. AskDrBrown.org. A S K drbrown.org. All right. Well, thanks for coming on, um, you know, with us. Good discussion. I think it's going to be helpful and uh, I'm thinking the audience is going to get a lot out of it. So thanks. Well, well, thanks. And thanks for all you do, man. I appreciate it. So glad that you're doing what you do. It, it does help a whole lot of people. All right, Mike. Well, I feel like I can sleep now. I can calm down because I, there's, there's no big <laughs> Illuminati NAR conspiracy. There's no, there doesn't seem to be some organized plot within the church. I, I feel like I can uh, calm down a little bit. Yeah, well, that, that that's good. I mean, you know, it, I think it's like anything else, you know, where you, it, it's a mixed bag, you know, the, the charismatic, charismatic stuff, the NAR stuff, you know, the, the, the NAR thing, you know, sort of reminds me of, um, you know, how Roman emperors, you know, might've functioned you know, Roman emperors were supposed to be gods, you know, and some of those guys are like, yeah, whatever, you know, I mean, I know I'm not a god, but if you want to talk that way, whatever. But then other ones took it really, really seriously. Uh, and, and so it, it just seems to me that, you know, some of the the leadership, you know, of, of something that could be called NAR or might, you know, be affiliated with NAR either openly or they're doing the same kinds of things with people who would declare themselves to be NAR, you know, that, that whole thing. Um, it seems that the more seriously they take it as though that's the thing to promote either their, their own status within it or, or some idea within it, um, that then, then we've got a problem. You know, if we, if we take it more seriously than the gospel, more seriously than, you know, a commitment to, to scripture, you know, elevating experience above scripture and this, you know, sort of idiosyncratic idea, you know, not really caring to investigate it scripturally, then we're going to have problems. So there, there's lots of problems here, lots of problems you know, within the church and other areas. So there we go. You know, it's, I think it's an issue of organization. It's an issue of caring too much about something that is peripheral and, and, you know, bad ideas get magnified when people grab them, they see some advantage to them and then they run with them either for self aggrandizement or, Maybe they're needy and they need attention or power or, or something like that. So, yeah, you know, I, it, I'm glad we had the discussion, you know, on, on, on both sides of it. I, I think Mike was pretty clear that absolutely there are things to be concerned about here. But, you know, it's not a, like you said, a big, uh, you know, sort of conspiracy. In other words, there, there's not like sort of unified commitment of thought, you know, like sort of driving an agenda. But people, people can get swept up in it. You know, they can they can latch onto some terrible theology and it can be quite destructive. So I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier as we wrap up here and just say, look, you were not saved to perpetuate a subculture. You were not saved to perpetuate a movement. You are not saved, you know, to perpetuate some denomination. Your focus should be on your your individual walk with the Lord trying to do something for the kingdom of God, which is not of this world. It's not tied to political structures or cultural structures or anything like that. But what can you do to, to, to do something positive there as, as often as possible through the course of your life? You know, have, have that as your focus, the people around you. And don't live for, for this kind of you know, stuff, this movement level stuff. Uh, it's just it's completely unnecessary. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad we had the discussion. Yeah, and I think 
Dr. Brown articulated it very well that the charismatics, the non-charismatics, we can learn from each other. Uh, rather than us Christians fighting amongst ourselves, let's learn what the other one brings to the table. Uh, yeah. You know, so I thought he articulated that very well. Yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm fine with doing that uh, as long as it's sort of disconnected from from a, a, a power agenda. Sure, there's abuses you know, that, for everything. That, yeah, I've I've seen you know the, the same kinds of things on the other side within, uh, you know, within fundamentalism. And and again, I've I've shared this before. My my sort of imperfect way of kind of parsing this is, you know, you can tell me you believe this or that, and you experienced this or that, or you saw this or that. You know, ultimately, I I don't know if it was of God. I don't know if it was true or not. I'm going to evaluate it by Scripture. I'm going to assume, especially if I know you, I'm going to assume that you have no reason to lie to me. And I and I am content to just let it there. You know, I don't feel burdened that I've got to, got to go out and imitate it. I've got to go out and validate it. I've got to go out and study it and, and, and destroy it. Uh, if, if your heart's in the right place, if it doesn't alter the gospel, if you're not adding to the gospel and marrying it to some other doctrine or your own experience, whatever, I'm just going to let it go. I'm content to let it go and be warmed and filled. But I, I, I'm, I just want people to think scripturally, you know, think well about whatever that thing is. And you know, we'll find out. The cream usually rises to the top. It, it'll it'll bear fruit one way or the other. Uh, but it's not it's not our job to be fixated on defending this or that. It, it's you know what are, what are we doing for the Lord? You know, honestly, you know what what are we getting done? So anyway, just I'm I'm glad we had both sides of the discussion, and we're able to do this. You know, we didn't expect to do two in a row right back to back, but glad we were able to do that. All right, Mike, I know I said it last episode that next week is back in the Hebrews, but we mean it this <laughs> yeah. time. Next week. Yeah, we mean it this Hebrews. time. That's right. <laughs> yeah, All right, Mike. absolutely. Well, we want to thank uh, Dr. Michael Brown for coming on, and uh, I just want to thank everybody else for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.